All right, so it's my distinct pleasure right now I have in the studio James Coles from North Valley Housing Trust and dialing in. I believe from Singapore we have uh, Thomas Morgan, the producer of the film. Welcome to KZFR, both uh, James Coles and, and Thomas Morgan from Singapore. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm, ac- I'm actually in Beirut right now. So Beirut. Even, it's even more... Uh, of a miracle that we have a connection <laughs> it is and it's a really it's a really really good one i hear you just as good as james he's sitting right next to me so so that's a beauty that's great why don't you tell us a bit more about thomas morgan and uh, how you got involved with this film storied streets thomas years ago i uh i was uh, i dabbled in writing some script i was never in the movie business i i was uh an investment banker and real estate developer in charlotte north carolina but i always was fascinated by the, the business and i always thought that uh, had i had it to do all over again i would have i would have gone into film but my father was adamantly against wasting college dollars on on film so i messed around with some scripts and i had written a script that touched on the issue of homelessness and that script got optioned. And so we had a reading and, and over the course of that reading, um, we had 75 to 80 people who were in attendance and, and they came up after and had several questions. And then one of the guys said to me, he said, well, what do you know about homelessness? Which was kind of odd because it touched on the issue, but certainly wasn't the main topic. And I told him I said nothing. And, and then he went on for 40 minutes telling me about the issue of homelessness. And, uh, and I said, well, how do you know about it? And he said, well, I was homeless for two years. And I looked at him and I thought, wow, this guy is the exception to the rule, right? And and they told me this story about losing his business and going through a divorce and struggling with depression. And so I went home and I had told my wife that, you know, this was really an interesting conversation. And then shortly thereafter, maybe two weeks after I was in my daughter's school and she was supposed to have a play date. And um, I said, well, you can go to Justine's house or Justine can come to our house. It doesn't matter to me. And she said, well, Dad, I can't go to Justine's house because Justine and her family live in the Walmart parking lot. So then I was really wow. kind of floored by that. And so uh, I went back and I said, you know, again, this another isolated I- incident, right? You know, exception to the rule. And, and my wife said, well, why don't you find out what the rules are? And, and I, I, of course, like most of America, thought I knew exactly why people were homeless. They were homeless because they were drug addicts, alcoholics, mentally ill, or they just wanted to be there. So I called the National Coalition for the Homeless and spoke to the guy, Michael Stoops, and Michael went through the whole reason that people become homeless. I thought it would be a 10-minute conversation, and two hours later, I was floored to still be on the call and and, and really amazed at what I was hearing. And actually, I was was so sure that he was wrong that I called back and got his boss and told him that maybe Michael shouldn't answer the phone because he clearly didn't know what he was talking about. (laughs) And he told me the same thing. So I was in New York and I was doing an investment bank deal and I ended up at this party and I thought, was talking to this guy and I said, you know, he asked me if I was in the in the film business because this party was around kind of a film event. And I said, no, I said, but somebody should do a documentary on homelessness in the United States. And he kind of jokingly said, but not too jokingly, he said, well, you should do it. And then I sat there for a moment and then I said, well, how about you? Are you in the business? And he said, yes. And I said, well, what do you do? He said, I'm a documentary filmmaker. I said, anything I would have heard of. He said, supersize me. So I was standing there talking to Morgan oh, Spurlock awesome. about That's this. Great, great. And then Susan Susan Sarandon walked over and Morgan said, Thomas is going to make a documentary about homelessness in the United States. And she said, how do I help you? And I told her, I jokingly said, again, right, you could be the executive producer or maybe you do some voiceover and she said of course so i went home and i said to my wife i said i know this sounds crazy but i want to quit my job i want to downsize my entire life and i want to do this and my wife being my wife said of course and so that's what we did and then uh i got a crew to get two crews together and we made the film so this so is your first film way, it, well that was the first film that i started i actually finished another film before i finished this one and then i was i made some short films just messing around but yeah that was the first one i kind of quit my job and embarked on that was a beautiful you're a beautiful That's storyteller it. thomas that was a wonderful intro for the next question <laughs> actually of what what should moviegoers expect when they view this film thomas well you know really what i wanted to do is explore why and how people found themselves homeless and and bring to their stories the humanity of the issue. You know, you can hear statistics all day long, but until you hear somebody tell that story and you see the the pain on their face and you understand what they've been through and how they got there and so many times their lives paralleled your life and then something went horribly wrong or sometimes they simply didn't get the chances you've ever gotten. And so that's really what I was trying to tell. And so this really is that story. It's the story from L.A. to New York uh, and everywhere in between of of how people ended up homeless. And I think it's really kind of, you know, jaw-dropping when you realize that 
somebody who is a drug addict, and maybe he's exactly what you expect until he tells you, you know, I was in a truck accident in eastern Tennessee, and they put me on high-dose painkillers, and I could never come off, and I got addicted to heroin, and here I am. And, and suddenly you realize, well, that could be my son, that could be my brother, that could be my father, that could be, you know, anybody. And I think that all of those stories are kind of the same. All of those stories you kind of hear, and you're like, wow, I mean, not what I expected. And these were people that literally we, we went across the country and, and found and, and just asked them to tell their story. And so 400 hours of footage later, we just had a compilation of amazing stories, and, and uh, that's what that's what the film is. You know, as someone that's edited a fair amount of film myself, I love how it started. For our listeners, I'm going to give you the first few sentences of the film. You know, I work. I get up in the morning, and I do my morning things, and I'm out the door of the shelter walking to work. What in your editing process made you choose that that poignant piece to start the film? I went around the country to find these stories and Philip ended up in Charlotte, North Carolina, exactly uh. where I live. And and I just thought, you know, that dispelled immediately what people thought. This guy works a full week. Every week he washed his dishes and he would walk to work and, and he was still homeless. He didn't make enough money. He, he couldn't get over the hump. And, and and we tried to help him as well. And we just sat down and said, well, clearly if he could budget properly. And then you start looking at the numbers and you, it's exactly what exactly what you think, that they simply don't make enough money to put a deposit down an apartment. They don't make enough money to be able to get utilities turned on. They don't have any credit. And on and on and on. And then you're just sitting there like, I can't, I can't believe this is the case. But... You know, lack of affordable housing and, and low-paying wages are one and two for the reasons that people become homeless in the first place. Also, if you watch the film closely, you realize that we go from what people in their minds kind of stereotype of who is homeless, and then slowly you're kind of exposed to, wait, that's a face I didn't expect. That's a woman. That's a child. That's a family. So African-American, male, white men, you know, so on and so forth. But as you kind of keep going, you're like, wow, these these are not the people I expected. And, you know, a kid abandoned when he was 14 years old and so on and so forth. I mean, I think it just kind of pulls back the curtain slowly. Listeners just joining, we have Thomas Morgan on the line from Beirut. As well in the studio, we have James Coles from North Valley Housing Trust. I'm going to turn this one over to James to pull him into the conversation. Is uh, What portion of portions of the movies stood out for you both and why? And I'll start with James Coles here in the studio. I went to an affordable housing conference in Salt Lake City, and at the end of the conference, they showed this movie, Storied Streets in a Theater, and it really impacted me, and I, and I thought, well, we've got to show this movie here in Chico. The part of the movie that really stood out to me, I think, was a big guy, a big African-American guy, telling his story about how he became homeless. I think he said he went for a long time where no one called him by his name. No one no one used his name, if you can imagine going going months and months with no one calling you by your name. And then uh, I think he was at a park bench or somewhere in a park. He became very depressed. He thought he might pass away. And then in the middle of the night, a volunteer woke him up and started asking him questions and finding out how he could help. And, and the question that stood out in my mind that this volunteer asked was, will you let me help you? And the man said, yes. And then he, I think, went on to work at an agency after he had gotten that help and, and kind of stabilized himself. He worked at an agency where they help other people that are homeless. And, and then he is able to now go out and help others that might have been in his same situation. And, and that really stuck with me as, you know, from both the volunteer perspective and also the perspective of someone who finds themselves homeless. I'll turn it back to you, Thomas. What's some one point of the film that maybe stood out more than others for you? I mean, that is really a great story. Stephen Thomas is the is the yeah. gentleman's name, and and he had a gun. He had found a, a, actually stolen a gun and was going to kill himself that night because he just couldn't do it anymore. And so he said, you know, he said he he had dug a hole for himself his whole life, and that night he was going to bury himself in it. And he said, you know, instead of getting buried in it, he felt like he was planted. He said, because that night a volunteer came his way. And so it, it is a very moving story. And I, and I think, you know, the other one is, is there's, a, there's a gentleman that, that throughout the film is kind of a narrator. and You don't really know what his, his story is. And uh, then you find out that he, his schizophrenia. And that story for me, you know, he's not what you think. He's not what you expect. He's, he's ridiculously articulate. He's able to explain issues. Uh, his name is David Pertle, and, and he just is so eloquent in his explanation of all of this. And then you realize, wow, 
how many schizophrenics or bipolars or people that you see on the street who have a mental illness are there because they're just simply not getting the medication or the care that they need? How many are, are falling through those cracks or how many lost that or will lose that now? I mean, think about the ramifications of, of Obamacare going away and suddenly people can't afford to get prescriptions anymore, maybe, or they can't afford to, uh, to get the same care. And so that for me really stuck out because he is He's a speaker for the National Coalition mm. of the Homeless. He's just an, an amazing human being. And it, it just draws the question of how many people go unhelped that we could easily help. I thought it was extremely important, the whole violence against homeless communities, the whole series of bum fights and the things that were actually stole, sold in stores. You'd be able to get homeless people being beat up by citizens. Before we move or shift to closing comments, I mean, I'd like to get a little some words around that from you, Thomas, on the violence of how people are perceived and how a lot of times they're violently either physically physically, verbally, or both abused in their situations? Well, you know, I think I think David Pertle said it well. You know, I think he said, you know, when, when you speak about someone in a certain way and, and it suddenly becomes, you, they've been dehumanized, uh, it, it becomes okay to, to hurt them or to, to harm them. And Susan Sarandon and I spoke at Congress about the issue of violence against homeless and the fact that it wasn't included as a hate crime when there were seven other, when you take the seven other hate crimes, combine them, all of them together do not equal the number of people lost to uh, fatality through violence that, that the that. number of, of homeless people do. It's amazing. I've actually approached the interfaith community here. They have an open letter about hate crimes. There's nothing in there about homelessness. And just nothing. To, nothing. Nothing. There's, they, they're defining everything other than homelessness, and I agree 100%. And I, you know, I tried to to walk the dime. I said, so if people want to you know, look at it this way or that, if you include rape, there's no discussion. I mean, rape against uh, women and, that are homeless is just one of the most horrible and most common occurrences in sex trade as well. It, it, it's just a ghastly, ghastly situation. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So, Thomas, we're here at kind of the, you know, we're trying to fit this into a half hour program. Gosh, I, I swear I could interview you for two hours. I got a whole outline for the whole movie. So I appreciate trying to <laughs> distill this down. I think you did a beautiful job with it. And I can tell just from your voice and the way you're presenting that this has been a, a you know, your project for how many months and years you've been working on this. But any closing comments around this film and, you know, try to get as many people in the seats over at Country Day on January 22nd, this coming Sunday as we can. I think the film resonates with everybody just because you'll see people who you think, wow, that could be me. And I think that's the part of the film that really always is the takeaway. And, you know, I hope that people go out and try to make a difference and they realize that homelessness doesn't only occur around the holidays and, and that there's a lot more that you can do. And it's one of the only issues that you can walk out of your door and make a difference. You know, you're not going to find the cure for cancer, maybe, but you can you can do something about this. So I hope they do. And I hope they pass this movie on. It's been, you know, it's been four years that this film's been out and every year it continues to be part or staple of the issue uh, around the country so i hope that continues